Hello and good evening, everybody. I'm Jason Silas with KOM Digital, and you are tuning into a wonderful presentation. So we want to invite you to stay on this live stream because we have got some really, really cool things coming for you right now. Um, I am in the theater at the Guam Museum here in the capital of Agatina, and we are going to present some seed talks featuring the Center for Island Sustainability at the University of Guam. Plus, art blogger Jeff Hamato has come all the way from Canada to let you know what's going on. Pow Wow Guam is happening right now, GAX is going on, and you are going to be inspired, you're going to be motivated, and you're going to learn something really cool. So stay tuned because there are really awesome talks coming right up.
So, how have you guys been tonight? Have you guys been enjoying the, the live entertainment, the live art? Yeah, the big shot? Um, so, another thing that we've done tonight was we, uh, we wanted to make sure that tonight was a zero waste event. And uh, so, can I get a show of hands if you, guys, if you guys know what zero waste means? Okay, there's a few people in the audience. So, zero waste means that we want to divert as much waste away from the landfill as possible. So, we want to make sure that we, uh, the waste that is generated from the event is either recycled um, or composted. So we work closely with the vendors to um, let them know that you know, we do have this goal and that they, you know, they need to comply with our mission. And so I, just, uh, I want to thank all the vendors tonight for, for you know, really coming through and you know, purchasing biodegradable products. I, I saw a few plastic bags out there and some non-biodegradable utensils, but you know, baby steps, right? It's a learning process. So I really do commend the vendors for um, their efforts, so they really are trying. So can I get a round of applause for the vendors as well? <laughs> now, one of our uh, signature events for our conference on island sustainability is our island sustainability community night. And um, last night we had the event at the Hyatt, and we had our Seed Talks for the second time. And uh, Seed Talks is it's our island version of TED Talks. I'm sure you've, you've heard of TED Talks. And so. Um, with ours, it's called CISC Talks, Ideas Worth Cultivating. So what we do is we, we do a shout out asking for speakers who might be interested in sharing some ideas or, or in, in, innovative ideas or things that they're passionate about that deal with sustainability. You know, we want them to give these uh, short yet impactful talks. And so we were able to have uh, five speakers last night and uh, we're lucky that we're able to have the um, Two of the speakers tonight, like well, uh, from last night, that will be able to do a talk tonight as well, and also another speaker that unfortunately wasn't able to make it, and so we're, we're glad that she's here with us tonight to do her her seat talk. So, so I won't speak anymore. I'll go ahead and move on to the seat talk. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the stage Dylan and Kylie Baker. Did you know, every year, about one person alone makes 
1,200 blue whales. With the growth of our world and economy, if we don't change soon, we may go past the point of no return. But don't get me wrong, plastic is not a bad resource. We wouldn't be where we are today without plastic. Plastic is almost everything that we use, such as cars, phones, the materials to build our homes, and so much more. So as I said before, plastic is not necessarily bad. It's only bad if we don't recycle it properly. We hope in the future we can find an alternative to plastic, but that does not fix the problem that already exists. Our world is covered in plastic, and we need to find a way to stop making more and reuse what we have. Plastic does not biodegrade, but breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. This means it will stay in our oceans and may end up in one of the five garbage patches around the world. So that's what got us thinking about what we can do to help. So our family started a nonprofit organization called One World, One Step. Our first project is the Clean Water Bomb Initiative. We bought a water bar that we put at events to minimize the use of single-use plastic. We have one outside.
We need to stop looking at the obstacles and start looking towards solutions. We need to work towards a better plastic-free Guam. We are one world when it comes to pollution. And if we all take one step in the right direction, we will all benefit. If not you, who? If not now, when? Thank you.
year round, or yearly, uh, worldwide. Um, and most people think that it's safe, and believe me, it is not. So it was patented in 1975 as an antimicrobial. It's never been patented as an herbicide, which is kind of interesting. Um, as I said, touted by Monsanto to be safer than water. It, how many of you are aware of the GMO Roundup Ready crops? Okay, maybe not so many. Okay, but we, the, the corn and soy, canola, um, uh, sugar beets, those are all Roundup Ready crops, and what that means is that they have been genetically modified in order to resist glyphosate. Okay, so they spray the entire crop to kill the weeds, and so the, all the all the grains, all the crops, the cash crops are sprayed, and all that glyphosate is taken into the plant. Go back. Sorry. Okay. But what I just found out recently is that wheat, beans, lentils, sugar cane, the I mean. All the legumes that I just love, they are all sprayed with glyphosate as a desiccant so that it, it um, speeds up harvest so that they can harvest it more, more quickly. The weeds are now resistant to glyphosate because it is being sprayed and used so ubiquitously. And so now they're creating new herbicides, including adding 2,4-D, which is a compound of Agent Orange. So glyphosate, I mean, Monsanto has always said, well, it's, it's safe because it disrupts the shipping pathway, which exists in plants and bacteria and um, fungi, but it does not exist in the human body. Well, the problem is that it, because it's, it's killing off those, that shipping pathway, disrupting it, so then the, um, the neurotransmitters of serotonin, dopamine, melatonin, and, and melanin are all, they're, they're entirely prevented from, from being created. So the number of, of diseases, the wide variety of diseases and conditions that are created are, is just, it's just unbelievable. It preferentially kills off beneficial bacteria in the gut, and now it is sprayed on, on farmlands in conjunction with tilling and use of synthetic fertilizers and fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, and which is considered conventional tilling or conventional farming, and it destroys the microbiome in the soil. And most people they don't really think about soil as having a microbiome, but it does, just like our gut. So what can we do to, to kind of reverse the impacts of, of glyphosate? Um, and I, I would like to explain in detail what glyphosate does with respect to, to all these various conditions, but I would need about three hours. So um, what, we, what we need to be doing is striving to eat organic. Now, we don't have certified organic on Guam. It's, pretty, it's a complex system. But at the same time, we can be embracing regenerative agriculture, which basically means no till, no chemicals, and cover crops, lots of cover crops, because it builds up the soil, and it provides the, the nutrients that the, that the plants need that they exude to the, to the soil and to the microorganisms that are attracted to that soil, I and mean, to that plant, and that they provide to the plant the, the minerals and nutrients that it needs that we need to consume. You want to eat wild fermented foods. That helps to reestablish gut biodiversity, which is just incredibly important. You want to get out in as many in different environments as you possibly can. Get out in the, I was going to say the mountains, but maybe the hills of Guam. Get to the beach, get out into the forest, and, and experience and breathe in those, those biomes, and you want to promote regenerative agriculture. So with respect to our farming, 
It, I know that we have farmers on Guam that are still doing conventional ag, and that includes the, the tilling and the uh, synthetic fertilizers and the, and the chemical sprays. We need, to, we need to get to the point where we just stop that altogether. Because when you stop the no-till, then you are enhancing the soil's ability to establish and, and thrive as far as the microdiversity is concerned. But also, it's sequestering carbon. And that can totally reverse climate change. We have, we in the United States, has over, have over 900 million acres of farmland. If even a small portion of that went totally regenerative ag, we could begin reversing climate change in a very short period of time. And so I think this is just so important and we want to promote cover crops on Guam. And thank goodness we don't do CAFOs here, but can't confine animal feeding operations. Those need to be, they need to be totally eliminated. Um, because they, they are feeding GMO uh, feed to the animals. The animals are, are sick. We are eating them. We are getting the, the GMO the, the, as well as the glyphosate. And so, in conclusion, I want to, I want to create a coalition that is going to ban uh, Roundup and consequently glyphosate on Guam. And I would like to pursue that through throughout my division. Thank you. Um, we really need to get to the point where we are we eliminate chemicals altogether. Um, we need to be taking care of the biodiversity in the soil as well as in our gut. And the only way we can do that is by eliminating chemicals entirely. We need to promote regenerative agriculture, and we can certainly do that here. I mean, um, you, you probably don't know this, but my bachelor's is in agriculture. And I worked with um, the cooperative extension, and, and we had no-till, but we were still, I mean, I sprayed glyphosate. I sprayed Roundup, because we were told it was safe. But it is not. It is not. So, and we want to research the effectiveness of Restore. Restore is a product that was created by a triple board certified MD by the name of Dr. Zach Bush. And if you, I listen to podcasts all the time while I'm driving. I drive a lot. I have my truck and I have almost 118,000 miles on it. But I listen to a lot of podcasts and I learn a lot. Dr. Zach Bush and Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who is a, a senior researcher at MIT, they have done incredible um, uh, research into glyphosate and its impacts on human health and the environment. And Dr. Bush was able to kind of discover a product in ancient soils that it's really interesting, but it creates the, the communication mechanism among all the, the bacteria and fungi and viruses so that they, they are operating as they're supposed to. So you can check it out. You can go to Restore for Life. That's Restore the Number for Life and check it out. I'm going to start taking it soon. But anyway, I hope that you see the importance of this. And if you have questions or want more information, you know, you can you can go on YouTube and just Google Dr. Zach Bush. He's he has innumerable podcasts and, and presentations at Autism One and all, uh, a variety of organizations. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff has, has done, she's been working on this for at least a dozen years. She has a very, um, uh, she, she's very, very interested in autism because a good friend of hers had an autistic son. Um, we, need to, we need to come together and we need to work on this because the, the individuals who are studying this now say that if we don't make substantial changes immediately, the human race is not going to exist in about 70 or 80 years. That we will be gone. And I think that we can just, we can do amazing things together, but we just have to, we have to have the will to do so and not say, oh, it's really gonna be fine when it's not. So. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it.
All right, thank you, Miss Peggy Denny. Wow, so that was that was quite a sobering topic, and I think it was your beer garden outside. Your dogs came in from there. I think we might have to go back out there real soon. But but thank you very much, Miss Peggy, for informing us in that very very serious matter. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's not over yet. Um, we actually do have one more seat talk, and uh, this individual is actually uh, my very very close friend and colleague, um, Miss Stefan Mignon. Can please come come to the front of the stage. So um, my friend Stefa, she's actually a sea turtle biologist with the UOGC grant program. And uh, just this afternoon, we received word that she was awarded the National Science Foundation Research Fel Graduate Fellowship. So can we get a round of applause for Stefa? <laughs> and uh, so it's a very, very uh, prestigious fellowship. Um, you know, thousands of people apply, and we're so we're very, very fortunate that a, a native of Guam was able to get this award. So. Um, as we're getting the slide on the screen. Um, so, all right, so can I get a, um, can I get a, a raise of hands with um, how many of you guys are, um, are really familiar with like a lot of the environmental issues that we're facing? Okay, well, you know what, that's fine because um, Seth was about to come up here and um, you know, you're about to learn a whole lot more. So, I learned so much from Seth, but, you know, she, uh, she does a lot of field work with uh, with green organisms, and uh, I learn so much from her every day, and you guys are about to learn a lot from her right now, so enjoy. Thank you, Bill. Uh, today, I hope you all are having a good night. It's like 9 o'clock right now, right? I'm usually in bed. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so I want you guys, I know we have a different range of audience here um, age-wise, but imagine your perfect office. How would that look like? Would it be at the tallest skyscraper with a beautiful view? Or would it have or would it have really cool artwork hanging on the walls? Or would it have an amazing view, an amazing library, and it's 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 beautiful, right? Well, if you ask me, my favorite office would be the beach. And that's exactly where I work as a sea turtle biologist. So my view is an ocean view and my seat is the sand if I get the chance to sit. And my desk is my trusty clipboard. And my clients are sea turtles. So more specifically, our mama sea turtles and our baby sea turtles here on Guam. So every morning, and this is early in the morning, um, I walk the beach and I look for sea turtle tracks that basically look like tire tracks. So usually, these tracks would lead to a nest but sometimes our turtles can be very picky about where they nest, or they can be very tricky. So, um, it's also my job to make sure that the eggs are nice and snug in there, and that they're safe from predators. But sometimes I'll pull all-nighters in the office, and I'll meet our mama sea turtles, and I'll watch them as they deposit their eggs into the sand. And, and then I watch them as they make sure, I make sure that they cover it back up, um, oops. Oh. Ah, don't see it. Don't look at it. Close your eyes. <laughs> and then, <laughs> is it going to play? Close your eyes. <laughs> and I make sure that all the mama sea turtles get back to the sea safely after um, I've observed them nesting. Next one. Oh. There we go. So after about 60 days, all of these babies, they'll have an egg tooth on their nose, and that's what they'll use to get out of their egg. And then there's about 100 babies in each nest. So once one hatches, all of the, this hatching frenzy begins, and they all have this energy to get out of the nest. And one by one, they'll all crawl out, and um, it takes about three days for them to get out of this egg chamber. So could you imagine, this egg chamber is about three feet deep, right? So for these little babies to crawl out that much space, um, it's a pretty big feat. And then I watch them as they scurry to the sea. Um, and they usually say that this is the most dangerous part of their life, but you know, they run for the sea. <laughs> and then they make it to the sea. Uh, and then eventually, they'll just follow the currents for years and years, and they'll just keep eating until 
they're large enough and then they reach their foraging grounds. So that could be in the Philippines, Japan, Indonesia, Taiwan. Oh, oh, sorry. Unfortunately, not all of them will, um, will survive. Um, in fact, only one in 1,000 will live to be an adult. Um, so really, every adult sea turtle is a miracle. Next. Um, so why is this number so small? Well, our sea turtles, they occur on land for nesting and in the sea, right? So they'll come, all of the threats that come with both environments will be present to them. So this is a flat beach, right? Um, and this is the aftermath after a typhoon, Typhoon Mankut. Um, and I don't like to see a flat beach, because usually that would mean that all of the huge waves, huge waves that come with the storms, they'll bring out all of the eggs back into the sea, um, and also the huge waves um, will drown out the nests. So the babies, they need oxygen just like each, you know, all of us here, um, and they can get drowned within their own eggs. Um, also, pigmentation is bad. We all know we need to control our ungulates here on Guam. Um, oftentimes, they'll eat through the whole egg chamber, which is very sad. Um, and also, ghost crabs. They'll snatch at the babies um, on their way to the ocean. Or sometimes, they'll go directly into the mound and get them as they're growing their eggs. So those are just a few of the natural threats, very few, because they have so many, but those are just a few uh, threats that they encounter. Um, but now we'll move on to the anthropogenic threats. So what are the threats that we as humans impose onto our sea turtles? So take a look at this picture, right? Is it familiar? It's Tumon Bay, right? So the first thing you notice is light. Um, and our sea turtles, they dig the dark. So mama turtles, They'll be hesitant to nest in this type of area. And sea tur the baby sea turtles, when they come out of their nest, they'll travel to towards the brightest light. So I don't want to see any baby sea turtles checking into any of the hotels there, right? They need to go into the ocean where they belong and where they'll be more safe. Um, boat strikes, you know, we have to practice safe boating. Um, one bad boat strike will mean one less sea turtle in our waters. Um, and our sea turtles, they're endangered, so there are not too many of them out there. Um, and they are federally and locally protected. Um, unfortunately, poaching is still an issue here in Guam, so it's very important to report poaching incidences. Um, so for example, here's a spear wound on a sea turtle, um, and her name is Mikuti. And she really is the cutest turtle I've ever seen. She has such a beautiful color, but she had a spear wound on the side of her shell and right by her eyes, so she almost died. Um, and she was rehabilitated at Underwater World for 10 months, um, and the biologists at the Department of Agriculture deemed her healthy to be released back into, to be released back into the wild. Um, so we want to see more of these happy endings for our sea turtles um, and less poaching. Um, and also global warming is a threat. You know, how could you imagine? Um, well, basically, all of the babies is determined whether they're male or female in their nest. Um, it's based on the temperature, right? So warmer nests would mean more girls, and cooler nests will mean more boys. So what would happen if we have global warming? And there's already evidence of the feminization of the sea turtle population happening today, and for one of the largest sea turtle populations here on Earth. Um, so that's something we have to look out for. Next. And also the things we leave behind in the ocean, right? So there's drifting rope and nets that can cause entanglement for sea turtles. And also plastic bags. Our sea turtles, they like jellyfish. And they'll often mistake plastic bags with their food. And another negative, um, another famous example is the viral video, right, of the sea turtle that had a straw stuck in its nose. How many of you guys have seen that? Yeah, okay. A good number. Um, next. So scientists in Costa Rica, they found this male turtle with a straw lodged in his nose. Um, and they believe that he ate the straw and he tried to regurgitate it back out. But instead of it leaving his body, it just got stuck in his nose. So could you imagine that? And look at that, the size of the straw. That's crazy. So it had to have been there for at least a few weeks. 
And I actually had the chance to meet the scientist who shot this viral video at the latest Sea Turtle Symposium. Um, and her, sh her sharing of this video sparked a movement for using reusable straws, right? So now we probably, do y'all have reusable straws? Yay, hey, cool, good crowd. <laughs> um, next. So this is an example in Costa Rica, right? So what about Guam? Is plastic having a negative impact on our sea turtles here in our, in our island? So Department of Agriculture biologists invited me to a necropsy for this sea turtle. She was found washed up in Talapofo Bay, and she's probably only five to 10 years old. Um, and if you look at her, right, there are no gashes. She's not entangled by any rope. And it looks like she's pretty well fed, right? But um, when we opened her up, we found something pretty disturbing. So the following pictures will be disturbing. <laughs> So we open her up and you can see that, this works, you can see that the size of her intestines will change as you go down the line here. And things look like there's some sort of obstruction, right? You see that? And a discoloration. Next. So we opened that part up and we just found this black material inside. Next. After washing that material, guess what we found? What does this look like to you? Yeah, black plastic trash bag. Could you imagine? Next. This sea turtle was foraging in Guam's waters. This is our own, these are our own waters. Isn't that crazy? But I take this as a message from the ocean. But how many more messages from the ocean do we need to live a more sustainable lifestyle? Um, in a recent study, it was actually found um, that plastic may be in every sea turtle out there. So in this study, they sampled stranded sea turtles around the world, and within these hundreds of sea turtles, next, they found plastic in every sea turtle. And that was just in one part of their gut. Next. And could you imagine our sea turtles they lived alongside dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period, and they lived millions and millions of years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's a very impressive feat. So if they can outlive the T-Rex, and if they can live alongside the T-Rex, can they outlive today's dinosaurs, which is plastic? And fast forward to the time of the ancient Chamorros, and we see that sea turtles play an important role in Chamorro culture. Next. Uh, they, were sustain they were sustainably harvested for consumption and their bones were made into tools. Next. And their jewelry was made, their, their shells were made into jewelry. So it would definitely be ashamed if, um, you know, we lose our sea turtles to something like plastic. Um, and we would definitely be preserving this piece of Chamorro culture um, if we choose to live more sustainably. Um, so all of the threats that I mentioned before, um, you know, those are all dinosaurs, dinosaurs that our sea turtles face, but other dinosaurs that they face, you know, that includes harvesting of sea turtles and their eggs, um, disease and loss of nesting habitat. These are all things that they have to, you know, serve that they have to combat in order to survive. Um, so why don't we give them one less dinosaur to combat? Um, and that's just through reducing our use of plastic. And it would definitely be ashamed if these sea turtles were lost to something that we can control and you know incorporate in our everyday lifestyle, and that's just by reducing our use of plastic. So I encourage you to pick up three, use three, and tell three. So by picking up three, when you're at the beach or just in a parking lot on your way into the building, just pick up three pieces of trash. So I usually like to pick up a cigarette butt or a plastic bag, something that would be deadly for a sea turtle. And I encourage you to use three. Use three reusable products. So make the switch from plastic bag to a reusable bag, plastic um, fork and spoon to bamboo cutlery, um, and then water bottle, coffee cup, straw, make it all reusable. 
Just like we don't forget our phones when we leave the house, make sure you don't forget your reusable products. And also, most importantly, tell three. Tell three people all that you've learned today um, and just be a steward for your island. It is really an honor to work with this species, um, to be with them, um, with the foraging population, to help the foraging population, um, to be part of the releases after poaching events, and to meet all of the mama sea turtles that we have here, our tomorrow turtles, and just to be for them when they're really struggling to survive. Um, you know, it hurts, you know, to see them when, when they're really trying their best and you, you'd want to be there for them. So this is that time, you know, this is that time to be there for them. So I really hope that you consider to pick up three, use three, and tell three um, after this talk. Um, and I'm very excited to see how far we'll go in sea turtle conservation and on behalf of Wong's Hagen, Sea Turtles Mossy. Thank you very much, Sasha. Now that concludes the UOG CISC talks. I think it's worth cultivating. Now I believe there's a few talks from some other folks, so if I can call on the next speaker. Woo! Woo! Okay. Okay. And welcome to the Guam Museum for Powwow Guam, the Guam Art Exhibit, and the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability present a talk with Jeff Hamada of Boom.com. And uh, by his own description, he uh, enjoys taking photos, making films, and dreaming up collaborative art projects. He's an artist, curator, and creative individual who in 2008 created Boom.com, critically acclaimed art blog, which pioneered the way we indulge in art and discover art in the digital age. We'll have a question and answer portion after he speaks. Without further ado, um, I'd like to present Jeff Amada of Boom.com. Thank you for coming. Just bear with me for one second. I have to load up my, my slides. Does everyone want to get up for a second? Get up on your feet and just have a nice stretch because I'm going to stretch and I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> stretch it out. Stretch your shoulders. Good. Sorry, everybody, one second. I don't know how to put that on the screen, though. I apologize, everyone. Is there a way just to put whatever's here? So leave all these on.
Okay, so this first thing I'm going to show is... Is it going to work? This is a video that I made uh, when I was still at art school, um, maybe 15 years ago. And uh, yeah, I'll just talk about it after we watch it. What will MI152 say today, I wonder? I turn off my computer. I wait. No, it's gonna work. Oh, okay. Oh. It impatiently as it connects. I go online and my breath catches in my chest. Okay, no, it's not gonna work. <laughs> I gotta get to the movie online. It, it's the movie you've got mail, but it's, it's been re edited. I swear this worked when we tested it before. <laughs> Well, NY1. Yeah, you're gonna really get really tired of them opening this thing. Okay. So we still need it to go. It just pops up here though, yeah. Just making sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. No worries. Got you. What will NY152 say today, I wonder? I turn on my computer. I had a good feeling you would be online now. I, I can give you advice, some great advice. Yeah, so that was a, a product I did in a, a class that was on remix culture, and um, it's kind of cringy to watch. It was, it's interesting to watch it now because at the time, uh, like the sort of abbreviations and all, all the things for the different lingo was like, people didn't know what like, I am H-O, like in my honest opinion, and, and so a lot of these things have sort of died out in 15 years, so it's like confusing again on another level. Like I don't know if anyone even says like, ASL, like H, sex, location, or how, these are like old like ways that people would chat. And whenever, no, it's good. Uh, so that was actually my first taste of of creating viral content. What happened was, yeah, you can just will I be able to let's, uh, advance with the? We'll find out. <laughs> okay, let me just test yes. this. Okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I actually uploaded that video to YouTube just for the sake of having it online somewhere. And then a website uh, stole my video and then I branded it as their content. And then it, I saw it like show up on all these websites and it was getting like millions and millions of views. And I was getting zero credit. And, and at first I was upset. I tried to email them. I said, you know, it'd be nice if you either got rid of it or gave me credit. Or, and I naively thought that this unnamed website would give me credit or, or, or listen to me. And, and they never did, and then other people downloaded off their website and then re-upload to YouTube. And it, and it was interesting to sort of see this thing that I made um, kind of taking on 
a life of its own. And, and that sort of like sparked this, um, I had this like obsession with the internet. And I started to do these little experiments and I started to realize I was interested in figuring out like sort of um, a side door for things. And that there was uh, a way that you're supposed to use technology or Twitter and um, I, I was interested in trying to see if I could figure out a different way to, to use these things. And I read this story, um, this is a true story, uh, about this guy named Anthony who posted on Craigslist seeking uh, to find people that would help him with some landscaping he needed done. So he posed, this is uh, back in 2011, he posts uh, this ad promising 28.50 an hour and uh, the, the ad says that people need safety glasses and eye protection, or a ventilator mask, and all these things that like are very specific things that these people have to wear. And he instructs all these people who want to work, get this job, to meet out front of a Bank of, Montreal, uh, a Bank of America in Monroe, Washington. And uh, so this, these are like images that, that are not the real thing, I just found whatever images, but this crowd of people shows up, these people are all obviously <laughs> ready, ready to work, and um, he dresses in the exact same outfit, and he proceeds to rob uh, the armored truck in front of the bank. And, um, and it's like everyone's been tricked, they've been hired to be decoys, and the real photos of the people. And, uh, and the police can't tell who's who because he's in a crowd of all these people that are dressed identically to him. And, and this is true, like he actually escapes down the river and floats away in an inner tube. And um, this is actually the real guy. And he's, I said sadly later caught because I think that's actually pretty brilliant to use Craigslist to try and rob. But I mean, I, I'm not promoting this, but I think the idea of using something for a completely different purpose and almost getting away with it is, uh, is actually pretty amazing. And um, so, <laughs> So I had this idea, this is actually before that legendary guy tried to rob that armored truck, that I would start this fake Roger Ebert Twitter account. And so this is like one of my tweets that I was really proud of. Uh, Dr. Price is very predictable. And I used to tweet every now and then these things that I thought were really, really funny. Like to imagine Roger Ebert just like using Twitter to just like say stupid things about movies. And I was kind of just, I didn't really have a big plan for it, I just thought it was, it was amusing to me. And then on Roger Ebert's actual website, he wrote uh, the other Roger Ebert's on Twitter about me, not even real Roger Ebert, which was my Twitter. And, and then his, he said, my immediate goal is to list more followers than that imposter. And I was actually so honored, like, I felt like, like he actually was watching what I was doing, and um, and it was weird because I felt like you're supposed to use Twitter one way, but I looked at it like, man, we're like, you're at this party almost with like, and, and Roger Ebert's there, and like I would never get invited to a party that that Roger Ebert was at, but Twitter was essentially that place, and uh, so even though he. Like probably hated me at that point. I was like so excited just by the idea that you could sort of find this um, side door. Of, I could talk directly to Roger Ebert in a way. Um, so these are like, I've broken up some of these things in the round thoughts. I actually, I had a whole talk um, designed and then I started hanging out with a bunch of the artists here, amazingly talented artists here in Guam. And so I started to try to change some of my talk based on the things that we talked about the past few days. And um, I live in Vancouver. It's a very medium-sized city. It's not like New York. Um, and this is what my website looked. I started a website in 2008. And it really, it was my personal journal. I didn't know how to really like, make a website, I was just sort of, like I, I would read about how you did it, and so I just sort of designed it as best I could 
uh, using like templates and just a lot of trial and error. And I think there's a, a real advantage to not being based in a, like a big city like New York where uh, people slowly started to like know about this thing that I was doing. And Vancouver's not like so small that I was the only one, but I was one of only maybe a couple or a few people. So here, just like over the years, um, the site changing. And this is kind of like how it is now. I got, I don't know why back here it's like really skinny, but then it just got like fatter and fatter as <laughs> time went on. And um, so I found that like people know me there as like the guy that blogs about art or something. And I realized that, yeah, there's an advantage to being in a place that's like smaller, because if you do that, you focus on doing that one thing, in you know a year or two, you're known as that person. So I think that's something to sort of change your perspective on Guam. It's like feeling like in some ways, or in a lot of ways, Guam is small, but you can really use that to your advantage if you want to be known. You know, for one thing, you can spend a fraction of the time that you would if you were living in a way larger city. And um, anyway, so I started just writing about, not even really doing a lot of writing. This is actually a bad example because it has lots of writing, but I mostly didn't write about a lot of things. They're mostly um, photos. And these are photos I found um, on Flickr. This is back when Flickr was actually cool and good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was this uh, woman named Elu, and I didn't know who she was, and I would sort of just like kind of, uh, it, because it was my journal, it wasn't like a, a legit publication or anything. When I started, I was just like using it like a Tumblr. I wasn't asking for permission. I was just like putting images up, and I email people after, and I'd say, "Hey, like I love your work. Uh, do you have other friends that are taking photos? Like, point me. I just wanted to like see a bunch of stuff I'd never seen before, and I was super naive about it. And I think like you have to be. I think you got to be really naive. And so when t someone tells you not to do something, you really have to sort of like learn it on your own. You got to do it anyways, because you don't really learn by someone else telling you not to do it and then just never doing it and not knowing why you don't do it. I mean, maybe that's not the best advice, but uh, for me anyways. So anyways, like, I post this girl's work, and she writes me this crazy email. It's like, this is actually like, I don't know, a couple of years after I posted. Uh, I'm not gonna read that whole thing, but essentially she says like, this guy in Austria, or a guy in Berlin actually, Austrian guy, saw the work, and then um, asked her to be in this like, photo competition, based on the photos that she saw in the post. And then, he, like, uh, maybe I'll just read it. So uh, I entered the competition that I won. And after a year or so, I was visiting Berlin, and some months in the summer, I wrote to him to ask if he would like to have a beer with me. We met up and started dating. After my holiday was finished, I had to go back to Istanbul. He told me he loved me, and he asked me to move in with him. After a year and a half, he asked me to marry him, and we got married. And she really wrote like, so basically you and your blog, which I admire, have changed my life forever. And so that's all I want to do is like get people married in my life today. <laughs> uh, so this is another, uh, another realization I, I had was uh, it's hard to take a bad photo of a sunset. And that, and sort of what made me have this thought was this amazing book. I don't know if anyone's read this book. Um, it's by two artists. And um, it was like an online project where they would have people do these like tasks. And the front cover of the book is a photo uh, based on the task to take a photo of your own parents kissing. And they would just have these really, um, easy to do tasks that weren't necessarily like art, but they're, they sort of, in the context of the site, became art. And I really like this idea of designing, or trying to get someone to do something without them feeling like, I gotta be an artist to do that. And um, anyway, so my quote related to this is I want to like, see if I can get people to do something. 
So like up until that point, I was mostly uh, just doing the thing where I was finding people's work, writing about it, telling them after the fact, finding out if they had other friends that were making work. And it was fun, but I really wanted to see if I could get people excited to submit their own, like, their own work, and not just work they were already making, but specific to like a project. So the first one was just like, I just wrote a blog post saying, take a photo of the sunset, I said it to me. And right away there was these really amazing images, like one of them was by like the editor of Trans World Surf magazine, and, and then there was like people who were lawyers, and whatever, there was like a whole variety of people that were like, people that were non-artists, people that, it was just like an amazing um, spread of types of people. And so I was like, what if we do another project where, uh, this is me actually in both those photos. It's a very embarrassing belt that I have in that photo. But then I, then I got on this like, actually got on this like skateboard website that I, I really looked up to called Apparel Tap and I was so excited. But, so I was trying to see like, would, would they go a step further and try to draw with light? If I explain like, you do a long exposure and you use a flashlight and it took like more effort. So I thought, you know, less people would do it. But then all these people started submitting these photos. And it was cool, like, they're not just doing the bare minimum of taking a photo of a sunset, but they're actually trying to do something, you know, putting in a little bit more effort. And then I did a project where, um, it was called Little Drifters, and this is something that I did when I was a kid. I would build little boats out of twigs and leaves and just like float them in like a river or like a lake. And it's a sustainable thing. You're not leaving trash because it's all like wood and twigs. And I was, I was very conscious of like, we're gonna be leaving these things. I want them to be all natural elements. And we had this barbecue at this park. I found out later you weren't allowed to have barbecues there, but <laughs> we, all these people came. And actually before they came, I was nervous because um, between this and the last project, there actually was a bunch of other ones I did, but I'd never done one where people had to come in person to be part of it. And that was like, I got really scared because I was, I knew that people would do these things online, but would people think it's stupid or would they like the idea enough to actually make the effort to drive out here? And it's like, I don't know, it kind of is not a cool thing to go and like, find random little twigs in the whatever and then like build it. And so like, I was really worried that no one would come and it would just be like my friend, like my few friends that were down to do it. But then like even way earlier than we were supposed to meet up, I could see all these people like climbing around like around bushes and like collecting things and they're like kids and then like adults and like people with kids but then also adults with no kids. It was like a whole range of people again. And then the newspaper, I kind of committed ahead of time. I was, the, the extra pressure on it was the newspaper found out about it and was gonna shoot photos of people. So I felt like extra pressure. If no one's there, I'll look really stupid. Um, but yeah, so people started, um, I, I showed photos of it and I started to encourage people from around the world to do it. And so these are, little drifters that were being made like all over the world and photos were getting sent in and there's like so many like really beautiful things that they made and and then I got this email I think a year later and it was a guy working in the Peace Corps and he said hey this is really random but I, I was looking at really old posts on your site and I saw the little drifters thing and I'm working with kids in Armenia and I thought it'd be cool if we did your project, so here's some photos. So these are like photos like way after the fact. Someone just thinking it's cool to go and do that where they live. And I don't know, something about the, like this happening was, uh, for me it's like one of the, aside from the girl meeting the guy getting married, this is maybe the next, maybe, they're, maybe this is better, maybe this is better than her getting married. I don't care about getting married. It's like the boat thing, well, maybe they're equal, I don't know. Um, so the products were getting, like I was getting more and more ideas and, and then I got approached by um, uh, Warner Brothers and Spike Jones, uh, his blog for the movie Where the Wild Things Are. And so this was sort of like a huge turning point for the site where 
we did this floor building project in the lead up to the movie coming out, and the submissions were crazy. And I think it was obviously because a lot of people knew who he was and loved the loved, loved the book and were excited about the movie. So many people were submitting to this, and I realized that like it fell in this sweet spot of like kids would want to do it, like really hipster, cool people would want to do it. <laughs> Other people who are old but aren't cool would want to do it. And then, like, even if your fort was really bad, the image was still good. Like, it was, like, endearing to see, like, really bad forts. And then also the level that some of these people, like, this guy built, like, a three-level wood thing in his garage. Like, it was insane. And uh, so I started to, like, I did more of them. This was, like, for Converse. It was, like, Converse heard about like, we want to do a skateboarding thing with you. We love the... So I was kind of just taking the same idea. It's not like rocket science at this point. I was like, what can I do that's related to skateboarding? It's like, just make skateboards out of like random things and they can be functional or non-functional. And so I kind of had like a recipe for like how to turn these ideas into something. And then this guy on the bottom left actually submitted a video where he like, it was like the stock market was like crashing and he like was like freaking out on his laptop and then he, Closes the laptop and there's like trucks and wheels on it. He like skates down this hill. It was insane. Um, and and then I did like a music one. This was like MTV and this. Actually, I don't even say the brands are involved. This is like a branded thing. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a music one. And then this one was cool because it was like people could submit sculptural instruments that didn't work, but then also submit. Um, functional instruments and people made like this one guy had this these things that he attached like electrodes to this like plant and then you could just like touch the plant and play like a piano like the different leaves. So they were submitting all these crazy videos and and then the projects were getting like more and more like um, involved. So uh, this is a project with Adobe and actually I, I did the project completely on my own and then Adobe had wanted to do a project but they they, I don't know, they, they were like, suddenly when radio silence on, I'm just gonna do this project on my own. And then they were trying to simultaneously do this other thing. And then they started seeing all these submissions coming for this project I wanted to do, which was remaking masterworks of art. And then they kind of got in after the fact by just like offering like Adobe, like Creative Suite, and all these things. I'm not trashing them, they're cool. But, um, <laughs> but this project was gonna go down whether they're into it or not, is all I was trying to say. Um, and there's some, yeah, like insane submissions to this project. Um, so much cool work. And um, this is like one. Of, this is my favorite image. And, um, and it became a book. So, so Chronicle Books, the publisher in San Francisco that I really like, they're like, we love this project. We want to turn it into a book. And I was like super down, and then I was really, from day one, pushing, I was like, I love this one submission, it has to be the cover. And uh, they weren't down with it for a long time, and I had to really be like, you know, we're doing this cover, and then I don't know if they thought, for some reason, it would affect sales of the book or whatever, but maybe they kind of tried to diss me subtly by putting my name across his butt. I didn't have any control of where my name went. But I was really happy that the book got made. Uh, this is a project I did in Hawaii. Oh yeah, so like, this kind of relates to the real Roger Ebert Twitter. It wasn't in there just as a, a joke, but it's like, I used to try to use Twitter in different ways. And so one of the things I would do is, I, would, I tweeted out just like, who wants free encouragement? And all these greedy people were like, I want free encouragement. So I picked the very first person and I said, everyone for the next hour, just encourage this one person. And if you include Boom in the tweet, then I'll retweet it, which is like breaking a sort of protocol of Twitter because I'd be like flooding my feed with this thing like all for the entire hour. But I didn't really care about like how you're supposed to use it. So all these people started encouraging this one person, I was retweeting it all and then and then it sort of finished, and then I was like, how can I do that better though? Like only one person benefited from the encouragement. So like a week later, I tweeted out like, who wants free encouragement? And all these people responded, and then I, 
I was like, I don't have anything to do for like the next hour. I'm gonna try to encourage every single person personally that requested it. And not just like, hey, you're cool. I would like go, if they had a website, I would like go to their website. If they had like a film, I try to watch at least part of it. I'd be like, hey, like Tony, your like dog, the video about the dog is so funny and great job. And I would just tweet these things like, and it, it got to me where I spent like five hours doing it, like my whole day. And more and more people were like requesting it and I realized that like all these big magazines have like, like tweeted out like, if you want free encouragement, like tweet at boom today and then they'll like tweet to you. And um, so I, I, and I couldn't, by the end of it I was having to do like, I felt bad, but I was having to group together like a lot of people into these like, hey, you're cool. Like the thing I didn't want to do at the beginning, I was like, hey, all of you are cool. I was trying to make sure everyone got one. Uh, and then I, I don't know, I just, I started to become really interested in this idea that like, everyone really wants encouragement. Everyone needs it. And it's a way to like, it's a foolproof way to get a list of the response because people are like, hey, give me, like, you're gonna give me something? I want the thing. So I was going to Hawaii for the, one of the powwow events. And the first couple of years, they sort of forced me to do murals there because they're my friends and they try to make me do things I don't want to do. But the, the third year, I was like, I'm not doing a mural. I'm going to do this other thing. And then I put up like a call for free encouragement on my website. But the twist was like I said, like you have to tell me specifically why you want encouragement and give me your mailing address, which was crazy. I didn't think that many people would do it. But like hundreds of people right away were like, like the, like crazy, not I shouldn't say crazy, like just like a lot of heavy stuff was going on for a lot of people. And and they're putting their full, it's probably bad, I shouldn't have done it that way, but yeah, the full mailing address was there. Anyways, I took all of it, I printed out whatever, and I walked around in Hawaii, and I was actually, my roommate that year was James Jean, this amazing artist. And he randomly had these this crazy box of postcards, and I already wanted to do this. I was gonna, I was planning to go to the store and buy all these postcards, but I told him my idea, and he's like, "Oh, it's crazy! I actually just released a box set of these, like hundreds of these postcards. You can just take them." So I had these really beautiful postcards, and um, I went around and I would, I just stop people that I'd meet on the street and say, "Hey, do you want to be part of this thing? It's like part of powwow." Um, you just gotta write a message to someone you don't know. I'm gonna read you something, and then you just respond to it however you want, you know, to encourage the person. Um, and it'll take like 10 seconds, or not 10 seconds, like a minute. And then if you're cool with it, I'll take a photo of you. Not everyone's cool with it, but a lot of people were. And some of the people that did it were some of the artists, like Matt Seas is an artist in the bottom, and there was a whole bunch to the festival, but it was such a amazing, response because a lot of people I expect them just to do like, hey, you're cool. But like you can see like how much writing there is on some of these postcards. Like and the guy in the top middle was really funny because he was like, I don't know how old is he, like 34, 15, I don't know how old the kid is. 14. <laughs> he had to respond to this like woman that was having like huge relationship problems and he's like, I don't know if you know if he had a girlfriend. He's I think he even told me he's like, I don't even know like how to talk to girls. So, but it was cool because I remember like, like he talked to other people I think that were around and then they're, it turned into this cool thing of like trying to figure out something to say to this person and really go outside yourself and think about how to help someone else. But then these people were the ones that were really enjoying it because the postcards hadn't even been sent yet. And there's another artist that was there that year, No Hope. And yeah, so some people drew on them, like, and at the end of the festival, like, I mailed out hundreds of these things. Um, anyway, so I, I was, I just, I liked those projects because they sort of had another level of meaning beyond just, like, building a fort for the sake of promoting a movie or whatever. And, um, but at the same time, like I told you, like the, the Converse skateboarding thing was in a way really similar to the Fort Building one. And I sort of came up with a recipe for how to make these things. And they were all working. And I actually don't even, actually yeah, I, I was gonna say I don't even know how I feel about this, but I do feel like this is true. 
that to me, if I have too many successes, I feel like I'm failing because it's, I'm not challenging myself. And doing these talks, like I've done a lot of them now, but they're never easy. Like I don't like public speaking. It's like a battle to be up here. But it's a weird thing where like I'm sitting there and I know I'm gonna hate it the minute, like, especially because like I didn't know how to work with this computer. <laughs> but there's a weird thing where like I love it because I'm like, this is like making me better. And and it's always the case where like if I get near the kind of tail end of my talk, I'm like, I feel like invincible. I'm not quite at that, maybe like the next slide, but like I feel like um you gotta do these things that you're really afraid to do, and that when something doesn't go right, when, when something fails, you don't get your work in a shell. There's all these different little obstacles, but that's like a signal that you're trying to do something that's like at your current limit of what you've been able to do so far. And if you never hit that, you're not like pushing hard enough. And I don't know how else to say that, but so, I started to try and do these things. I'd gone, I'd studied film in art school, but like I hadn't done anything film related for so long. And so uh, I talked to Jasper, did powwow, and I was like, I'd love to direct this piece about, or like make this video about powwow. And I, I know we're probably short on time here, so I'm, I'm going to show the video. But uh, we made this video, and it was sort of just like assuming that I knew we could do it, and then. I made this skate video, I, I'll produce it, it was more, the other guys directed it, but we built, like, the guys built this crazy half bike and we stuck it on, we stuck the half bike onto these train tracks. They were like not being used, but like, it was still um, sketchy to like, figure out how to do this, and then we built it in two halves on the track, and we just stored it under the bridge, and there was bums that lived in it, because we stupidly built a cabin for them to live in, I don't know why we did that with it. Um, and so like, I, I really wanted to like, Try to do a bunch of stuff I'd never done before. So I, I, on that shoot, Red Bull was filming a behind the scenes, and I just cold pitched the guy while we were shooting the skate video on this other idea I had for this like animated series. Even though I'm not an animator, I don't know anything about it, and I just convinced them that I was the guy to oversee this whole, this whole project. And um, this was like a series of long, like six artists talking about like when they, they like a significant turning point in their career where they like creatively went in a new direction and like get interviews with all these artists around the world and then edit them. I was like editing the sound down from like an hour to our interview down to like five minutes and then finding all these animators and it was crazy but like uh, I was so it was the hardest project I think I've ever done and partially because I had got myself in over my head because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just assumed I could, but I think there's something really important about like you're always going to get to a, an opportunity to do something that you feel is too big for you. But if you turn it down, someone else who's just like you is going to do it, and then you're going to be like, "Oh, why did that guy get that opportunity? Like I should be doing that." And anyway, so like I think like I have a harder time doing the same thing over and over, and I really get excited when it's like, I don't know how this is gonna go, and I like the fear and the danger of like, it could all fail. Kind of like changing my whole talk last night and just throwing it. <laughs> but, so this is sort of like the last um, thought, is, I, I mean like, when I was making my own art, it was text art, and I like playing with words and overhearing things or writing out things and I would like type out some of these things on a typewriter and anyway so like this thing doesn't look like it makes sense but I, I'm gonna try to make it make sense and the idea is I don't think the point is to uh, conquer a fear at least for me I'm unable to completely remove fear from my life. So I was like, if I can't get, like, get fear out of my life, how can I use it to my advantage? So I do this weird mind game thing on myself, which is, 
if I can't overcome the fear, I'm just going to find a bigger thing that I'm more afraid of that is in the opposite direction and let that fear be more than the smaller fear. So like, my fear that this talk will go badly, that I think about like, what if I don't do the talk and all the opportunities that could come, all the people that I would have met, all these things, that fear, like the fear of lifelong regret is a much bigger fear. So I concentrate on like, I have to do the talk, I have to come here, I have to do this thing because the other thing is so much worse. And so the saying is like, let the fear of letting fear dictate your life dictate your life. So letting fear dictate your life is the middle, I should have put that in a different color. I actually like it being really confusing. Letting fear dictate your life is one fear, but then letting that fear dictate your life is how I live my life. And so like one of the powwows uh, was before I met my wife, there was like a girl that I met and she's like, let's go on this hike. And she's like, I know this cool place where there's this um, crater where we can like go and jump off this waterfall. And I'm like, I'm a really bad swimmer and I don't like heights, but I was like, yeah, I'm down to go on this hike and jump off this waterfall. And so we go do this hike and it's like a crater where you have to like swim across. So you're like already committed once you start to swim across, so you're not gonna like swim there and then fail, and then swim back without jumping off this thing. So like, I swam across and I was like, oh my god, this is like the stupidest idea. <laughs> and it wasn't like a cool, like nice like path to like where you jump off. It's like this, like you're like shimmying along this little ledge. And like I got like halfway where like I froze and I was like, if I fall off here, like uh, I'll, I won't, I probably, I might have died, but like, I just would be like very injured. And I look so stupid in front of all these really cool Hawaiian guys that are all there and they're like backflipping off this thing. Like, so just to not look stupid, I just continued on and got to the platform. And then I jumped off and I felt like so cool. Like I had like done this thing. And I posted this photo where I thought I looked cool. And my friends were like, oh, you think you're cool? Come with us to a real, a real cliff. And and I was like, no, 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 I'm good. Like, that was my one thing for this trip. Like, I only want to do one thing where I risk my life. That was it. And they're like, well, let's just go there and let's, let's eat our lunch there. And we'll just watch other people do it. And this is like Kamea, uh, one of the directors of Powell in Hawaii. He's notorious for like um, peer pressuring people into doing stuff. And I'm saying this knowing that it's on, on video so you can watch it. But, so we go, and he immediately, like there's a crowd of people, there's a place called Spinning Caves, it's a, it's a, I think it's, well it's a pretty big cliff, and we're literally there for two seconds, and he's kicking off his slippers, and he's like, I don't want to be treading water for a long time waiting for you. And he literally just runs and jumps off this cliff, and so this is the cliff, this is me jumping off of it just after he jumped it. Um, it's, it's a pretty big cliff. Uh, so he jumped and then like, I was like, that, I had that same thought process before I jumped, was like, I'm afraid of doing this. I actually, I don't recommend doing any of this. I was gonna say like, I don't relate this to like, this actually doesn't, this is the stupidest thing because it doesn't apply to the 10 successes of the failure because you always wanna succeed with cliff jumping. This actually undermines my entire talk. But I did it because I didn't, I looked over and I was like, if I never do this, I'll never know what it felt like, and, but I don't recommend you doing this. But I did it, but I don't recommend it. And I guess like, and I always, I have no desire to ever do it again. But on a smaller scale, I feel like, for everything other than cliff jumping, I feel like that it's actually a good trick to think about like, can I trick my brain into making myself do this thing that I know makes me really nervous and I'll have anxiety about um, because of all the like rewards that are on the other side. And there's not really any other rewards on the side of this because you just feel cool for like a little bit. But I think in terms of like, because I'm assuming there's some artists here, there's gonna be times where like, you get asked to do a show and the gallery might be really big and you don't have lots of work and you're like, I can't do it. And you say no. And, 
or there's like a big illustration job and the brand is like a global brand and they want you to vector all your files or these things and they're talking like techno mumbo jumbo and you're like, I don't know how to do that. So you reach, you're like, I'm not, yeah, I can't do it. And it's, I deal with it so much where I, I'm, I try to use my site to help people get to the next level. And there's so many people that I hear saying they want the opportunity to do it. And then when they get the opportunity, a lot of them, they don't follow through with it. And it's, it, at first it was surprising, but I've run my site now for 11 years. And I just see it so much. So I think I just wanted to leave you with, not with the image of me jumping off this cliff, but just this idea that like, you're, the idea is not to like destroy all the fear that you have, but those should be real clear signifiers. I'm talking career-wise, things you're afraid of, that should make you realize there's something there that if I was able to go towards it, so much growth and reward and all this other stuff is on the other side. And anyways, I just wanted to encourage people here to do that. Not necessarily the cliff thing, but in terms of your art or whatever else. Um, sorry, that was really random. That was, that's pretty much my talk. I think I'm gonna end it there, but if there's anyone that has any questions about anything, I would love to answer a few of everyone's. It's okay if nobody has any questions. <laughs>